Hey, this is Mr. Mason Data. What we're going to do in this tutorial is we are going to review how to solve problems that involve linear concepts. So this first problem reads that a line passes through the points 1, 4, and 5, 8. A second line passes through the points 2, 10, and 6, 4. At what point do the two lines intersect? Now, the easiest way to solve this problem is to get some graph paper and start by plotting these two points and forming your first line and then plotting these two points and forming your second line and see at what point the two lines intersect at. So let's go ahead and do just that. The first point we have to locate is at 1, 4. The second point is at 5, 8, which is located right here. And then we're going to take a line and run it through those two points. All right, and then what we're going to do is find a point at 210, which is located right here, and at 6, 4. And then create a line that runs through those two points. And we can see that our two lines intersect at this location, which is positive 4 for the x-axis and positive 7 at the y-axis. So the answer is 4, 7. All right, let's go to the next problem. All right, this problem is asking, if you graph the following two equations, at what point will the two lines intersect? So what we should recognize right away is that both of these equations are already in y equals mx plus b form. Now the very end of our equation indicates where our line is going to cross the y-axis. We call that the y-intercept. And for the first equation, that line would cross the y-axis at negative 1. So what we're going to do is make a point right at negative 1. Now, from that point, we are going to make additional points. And we're going to use the given slope to do that. And the number in front of x is the slope of the line. So what we're going to do is take the slope of 2 and just put a 1 on the bottom to form a ratio. We would say that the rise of our line is going to be 2 and the run is going to be 1, and we are going to form additional points by rising up 2 and going over 1. And we can do this again. We can go up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. All right, now that we have enough points to form our line, let's go ahead and form a line that passes through all of these points. Now, let's go ahead and graph this line, which crosses the y-axis at positive 5. So we start by making a point at that location on the y-axis. All right, now we look in front of the variable x to see what the slope of our line is. Now remember, if there is no number written in front of the variable, that means that the coefficient is 1, which means our slope is 1, or in this case, negative 1. So we would say the rise of this line is going to be negative 1, and it is going to have a run of 1. So from this point, what we're going to do is go down 1 and over 1 and form a new point. And we're going to repeat this process. Here's another point. And we can see already that our line is going to intersect at this point with this line. So we're just going to make a few more points here by going down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. And then we are going to go ahead and form a line that passes through these points. And then what we do is just state the coordinates of this point right here, which is positive 2 for the x value and positive 3. So positive 2, positive 3 are the coordinates where the two lines intersect each other. All right, let's go to the next problem. All right, this problem states that Emily went for a walk and a jog. It says first she started walking. And after a few minutes, Emily began jogging at a faster speed than she was walking. So that means that she was jogging second, and then she got tired and slowed down to a slower speed than she was jogging, which pretty much means she was walking again because she's at a slower speed than when she was jogging. And we have to determine which one of these graphs best represents the distance Emily went. Now, according to the information given, we can see that Emily basically had three parts to her walk. 
she started out walking and then she started jogging and then she went slower than her jog. So probably back at some sort of walk or a very slow jog. We can see that each one of these lines has three distinctive parts. We have a first line here, a second one here, and a third one here. Same with this graph. We have one, two, three parts, one, two, three parts, and one, two, three parts. Now, one thing that we should remember about graph lines is that with any horizontal line, the slope is going to be zero. So let's take a look at choice A. If we take a look at our line right here, because it is horizontal, we would say that the slope is zero. And because this part of the graph is flat or horizontal, we would say that the slope is also zero. Now, what that really means is that Emily's distance is not going to change because notice the line is not going up at all. And because distance is on the y axis, there is no change in y. Therefore, the slope is going to be zero. Now, remember, the first part of her excursion is walking. Now, walking would mean that you are actually covering some distance. So there should be some slope to the first part of the graph. And because there is no slope at this first part, that means that Emily would be standing still. She would not be moving at all. Therefore, choice A cannot be our choice. Now, let's take a look at this graph right here. Now, we can see that Emily is covering a certain amount of distance as time moves forward. But on the second part of the graph here, we have a slope of zero, which means she is not moving. But in the information given, it said the second part of her excursion, she was actually jogging faster than when she was walking. So this definitely cannot be our choice. So let's go ahead and get rid of choice B. Now, if we take a look at choice C here, we can see that Emily is moving a distance over time for the first part of the graph. But for the second part, she's not moving at all. We can see here that from this point to this point, the distance does not go up or down as time moves forward. So this cannot be the correct choice because it says in the problem that she was jogging during the second part of her walk jog. So the answer must be D. So let's take a look at the way that the graph is shaped. So if we take a look here, we can see that she is covering some distance over time. So we can see that from here to here, there is a slope to that line. So we go up this amount over this amount of time. And then for this part of her excursion, she goes this distance over this amount of time. And for the last part of her excursion, she goes this distance over this amount of time. Now we can see that the first part of our graph here is a little bit flatter or closer to zero, which means she's not covering that much distance over time. And it does say that she began walking, so that would make sense. And during the second part, notice that the line is going up much steeper, so we can see that Emily's covering more distance over a relatively small amount of time. And then it tapers off at the end, and it's kind of back to a walk. So look at the shape of this slope as compared to this slope. They are very similar. And as we can see in the information, it did say at the beginning she started walking and she kind of ended walking. And the middle part of her excursion was a jog, which is this part right here. All right, let's go to another problem. This problem reads that the graph below shows how much money Jada saved from babysitting. Assume she saves all of her earnings. Examine the graph and answer the questions below. The first question is asking, how much does Jada earn per hour? Now to figure out how much Jada earns per hour, what we're going to do is determine the rate of change of this line. And the rate of change is also known as the slope when it comes to a linear function. So what we're going to do is identify some clear points on this line so we can figure out what the slope is. And we can clearly see that we have a point right here at 0, 040. We have a point right here at 270. We have another one right here at 4100. Another one here at 6130. And another one here. Now, if we take a look at this linear relationship, 
we can see to start off with here, we go from 40 to 70. This first point is at 40 and this second point is at 70. So we would say the change in Y is $30. So we're gonna say the numerator is 30. Our change in Y always goes on the top. And then if we go to the right, we can see that that is over a course of two hours. So the denominator is two. So what we have to do is simplify this rate here, and that would be equal to 15 over one. So we would say that Jada earns $15 per hour. All right, the second question is asking us to determine how much did Jada have saved before she started babysitting? Now, we can see that she is earning $15 per hour according to the first question that we just solved. Now, if we take a look though at the beginning of this line, we can see that she starts off with $40 before she even works any hours babysitting. So we can see the X value at 40 is zero hours. Well, how could she have money even though she did not work any hours babysitting? Well, that is because she probably had money saved in the bank. So before she starts saving money through babysitting, Jada already has $40 in the bank. So the Y intercept is really what we are talking about here. Jada has $40 in the bank before she even begins earning money babysitting. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna combine the rate that she is earning money per hour and the Y intercept to form our slope intercept equation in Y equals MX plus B form. So we start off by writing Y and then we say it is equal to whatever the slope is. In this case, it is $15. And we have to multiply our slope by X. And at the end, we write our Y intercept. Because our Y intercept is $40 and it is positive, we write plus 40. All right, let's go to the next problem. Now, with this problem, we have to be careful. In the past, I've had students not even read the problem given at the top. All they do is they look at the graph and they see a line going through positive three, and then they look for an equation with positive three, and then they just choose that selection. However, this problem is not asking us to figure out which of these equations represents this line. It is asking us to figure out which of these four equations has the same slope as this line that is graphed. So let's go ahead and just figure out what the slope of this line is. So we can see that this line passes through this point, which is easy to identify. It is at negative four, positive four. We can see that our line crosses right here at positive three through the y-axis. And we have another point right here. Now we can see that our line is moving downwards from left to right. So our slope is going to be negative for sure. And if we take a look at all of the coefficients in front of X, which is going to be our slope, we can see that this one is negative. This one is not, so this cannot be our choice. We can see that this slope is negative, but this slope is not, so this cannot be our choice. So it has to be the first choice or the third choice. Now from this point to this point, we can see that we would have to go down one. And from this point to this point, we would have to move over one, two, three, four. So we can see that the slope of this line is negative one because we go down one and over four. And the choice or the equation with the slope of negative one fourth would be this one right here. Now, don't be fooled. Every once in a while, you may see an equation that is a little bit different than y equals mx plus b. All they did here is they took the y-intercept and wrote that first, which is really the b, and then they wrote the mx term last. However, this is still considered a linear equation because of the commutative property of addition. You can add this with this and switch those two terms around, and it really means the same thing. So this is the choice that we should have selected because this equation here has a slope of negative one fourth, which is the same slope as this line right here.
All right, let's go to the next problem. All right, so in this problem, it says that a rental company charges a flat fee of $50 to rent a jet ski. In addition, renters must pay $17.50 for each hour of ski use. Which equation represents the total cost C to rent a jet ski for H hours? Okay, what we're going to ask ourselves first is, what are we looking for in this problem? Well, what we are looking for is the total cost represented by C to rent a jet ski. And whatever you're looking for is what you write first. So let's write the letter C and then set that equal to whatever we have to do to figure out the total cost to rent a jet ski. Well, the problem states that the jet ski is going to be rented at a rate of $17.50 for each hour. Now, if you ever read language that indicates a rate, like a certain amount of money for each of something or per something, that is a dead giveaway that you are dealing with slope. So what we're going to do right away is take this rate, $17.50, and we are going to multiply that by the number of hours represented by the variable H. So if we think about it, we can substitute H with any amount of hours we want to rent this jet ski for and multiply it by $17.50. So if we wanted to rent this jet ski for two hours, we would multiply $17.50 by two. Or if we wanted to find the cost at three hours, we would multiply this dollar amount by three. Now, this is not the total cost of the jet ski, though. Remember, there is a flat fee of $50, and this is a one-time charge. We are not multiplying this by anything. This is a one-time fee that we are going to tack on to the total cost. So if we knew the amount of hours we were renting the jet ski for, we would substitute that in for H, multiply it by 1750, and take that result and add 50 to that, and that would be equal to the total cost represented by C. So we should select this choice right here. All right, let's go to the next problem. All right, this problem is asking the question, what is the slope of the line that passes through the points 1, negative 3, and 4, 2. So what we're going to do is use the slope formula straight away. So we're going to take our second y, which is 2, and subtract it with our first y, which is negative 3. And then what we're going to do is take our second x, which is 4, and subtract that with our first x, which is 1. So remember, our slope formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is the change in y values as compared to the change in corresponding x values. So for the numerator, we have 2 minus negative 3. Now remember, when subtracting a negative, we have to take these signs and make them positive. So that gives us 5 for the numerator. And for the bottom, we have 4 minus 1, which is 3. So the slope of a line passing through these two points is positive 5 thirds. All right, let's go to the next problem. All right, this problem is asking, what is the equation of the line that contains the point 1 half negative 3 and has a slope of negative 3? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this point right here and plug the x value into each one of these x's for each equation, and then we're going to solve and see if the y in that equation is equal to this y, which is negative 3. So let's take this first equation here, and we're going to take y and set it equal to negative 3 and multiply it by the given x, which is 1 half, and then we are going to subtract our y-intercept, which is 3 halves. All right, so let us go ahead and multiply negative 3 times 1 half. That would give us a product of negative 3 halves. Remember, when multiplying a whole number by a fraction, just turn the whole number into a fraction by putting a 1 at the bottom. So the numerator is just negative 3 times 1, which is negative 3, and the denominator is 1 times 2, 
which is 2. Now we just bring down this minus 3 halves. Now remember when adding or subtracting fractions, your denominator must be the same, and it is in this case, so we can just rewrite our denominator as 2. Now for the numerator, we have negative 3 minus 3, which is a total of negative 6. And what we have to do now is simplify this, which gives us negative 3. Negative 6 divided by positive 2 is negative 3. And that is the y that we were trying to get. We plugged 1 half into the x of our equation, and we solved everything here on the right side. And it ended up giving us y is equal to negative 3. And that is what we are looking for. So we got lucky because choice A is the answer. Now, if we took 1 half and plugged it into this equation, let's just demonstrate that it would not equal negative 3. So let's take negative 3, multiply it by that same x, which is 1 half. And we did that with the first equation. That ended up giving us negative 3 halves. But we have a different y-intercept. We have positive 17 halves. So we have a denominator of 2 and a numerator of negative 3 and positive 17, which is a total of 14. And 14 divided by 2 is 7. And that is not the y that we are looking for. We want y is equal to negative 3. So this is not the correct choice, as these two are not the correct choice as well. All right, let's go on to the next problem. All right, this problem reads that Javion recorded the 7 a.m. temperature at his house the first five days of four different months. Which data are nonlinear? So basically what we're doing is looking for which set of values in a table would not form a straight line. All right, so let's take a look at February here. We're going to take a look at the change in y values first. From negative 5 to negative 9, the value drops 4 degrees. And from negative 9 to negative 13 is another drop of 4. Negative 13 to negative 17 is another drop in 4. And we have another drop in 4 right here. Now for the corresponding x values, we have an increase of 1 day, 1 day, 1 day, and 1 day. So we can see here that we have a constant rate of change with the values in this table. So we would say that February is displaying a linear situation. So this is linear. We're looking for what is nonlinear. All right, so let's go ahead and explore March. Now, all the days go from 1 to 5, so we can see that the increase in x is always going to be 1. So let's just focus in on the y values. So here we have a decrease of 2. And this is a decrease of 2 as well, another decrease in 2, and another decrease in 2. So all corresponding changes in y's and x's are negative 2 over 1, which would be a slope of negative 2. So this is a linear situation. So let's take a look at April. We have an increase of 4 here, an increase of 4 here, an increase of 4 here, and an increase of 4 here. And of course, the corresponding x values all increase by 1. So we do have a linear situation here. So the situation that is not linear must be May. From here to here, we have an increase of 3. And from here to here, we have an increase of 4. 67 to 69 is an increase of 2. And lastly, we have an increase of 5. So the first rate of change is going to be 3 over 1. And then we have one that is 4 over 1. And then 2 over 1. And lastly, 5 over 1. So we do not have a constant rate of change. Therefore, May is a situation that is, in fact, nonlinear. So D is the correct choice. All right, let's go ahead and do our last problem. All right, we have to determine which of the following tables shows inputs and outputs created by the equation y equals 1 half x minus 2. 
So let us go ahead and test choice A. Now, if we were to take this first input, negative 8, and plug it into the equation, we would have to multiply this input by 1 half and then subtract 2. So let's go ahead and do that. So half of negative 8 is negative 4. And if we subtract 2, that would give us negative 6. However, this says positive 6. So right away, we are able to eliminate choice A as an answer. Now, if we wanted to plug a different input just to feel more reassured, we could go ahead and do that. So let's take 1 half of 6, which is 3, and then subtract 2 from that. And that would give us 1 and not 5. So this is definitely not the correct choice. So let's go ahead and take a look at B. Now, notice with choice A, we plug negative 8 in first, which is the same input here. And when we did that, half of negative 8 is negative 4. And then when we subtracted 2, we came up with negative 6, which is the output. But we have to be careful. Just testing one input does not mean that's going to be the answer. So let's test another situation. Now, if we were to take 1 half of negative 4, 1 half of negative 4 is equal to negative 2. And then we have to, according to our equation, subtract 2 more from that. And negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. So we do have the correct output here. And if we plug 0 into x here, 1 half times 0 is 0, minus 2 is negative 2. So we have enough reassurance here that B is the correct answer. So we can eliminate choices C and D. Hey, I just want to say thanks for checking out this math tutorial. Please don't forget to hit that subscription button and activate notifications so you can be informed as I upload new math tutorials that just might help you with your math homework. Until next time, this is Shane Masonette with Mesa Dead Math.